Hi, I'm Shmaya. It's like papaya, except it's not. And this is Plot Twist, please. Here on this channel, I like to talk about media, mental health, and the intersection of those things. I am a black autistic woman. It is more obvious that I am black than that I am autistic. But I like to talk about those things as well. You can listen to this podcast through the channels listed in the description box, or you can watch it on YouTube. But today on this episode, I want to talk a little bit about dating shows, and specifically reality dating shows, and whether or not it is beneficial for Black women to participate in them. Will dating shows ever benefit Black women? Now, I am someone who loves to watch reality TV, and the reason being, I think that reality TV is a great mirror into what society looks like, or even how I interpret things can be a reflection of what I need to work on, <laughs> need to heal from, or whether there are things that I think reflect our society at large, specifically as it pertains to Western culture or American culture, as I am an American who lives in America right now. That is the environment that I have the most knowledge of and can provide the most thorough analysis on. Another reason why I like to watch reality TV is because admittedly, I like mess. Like sometimes you just like to watch a little mess and then go on about your day. Sometimes you don't like to think a ton, but then because I'm me, whenever I watch something, regardless of what it is, I'm always going to see a larger theoretical idea connected to it, and or I'm always going to want to try and analyze what this piece of media means on a larger scale. Um, but that's just me. I know that's not everybody. That's just Shamaya. I do think it's interesting too, the way that reality television has been kind of, I don't want to say hyper, hyper feminized, but, but there's been this misconception, I think, that only middle-aged women like to watch reality TV or even more specifically people who don't have anything better to do. When I completely disagree with that sentiment, I think that there are plenty of people with high-paying jobs or people with busy lives who spend, even if it's a little bit of time, they spend time watching reality TV, whether it's something to go on in the background of what they're doing as white noise or whether it's something that they're particularly, particularly invested in or passionate about. You know, when you find a character that resonates with you, you follow that character, you root for that character. And that character, of course, is created by an actual person or by producers who are interacting with actual people behind the scenes. I don't want to ignore that. <laughs> but that is absolutely the, the lens through which I'm going to be conducting this breakdown. The assumption that characters in reality TV are also people is paramount to this discussion that I'm about to have, or to, to this deep dive that we're about to go into. So I just need us to be on one accord with that. But yeah, in the grand scheme of things, I don't think reality TV is the most pertinent topic. I don't think it's the most life altering topic that's being discussed. Of course not, but it doesn't mean that you're not allowed to care about it. It doesn't mean that you're not allowed to learn something from it. In fact, I think there's a lot to learn from reality TV. So one of the reasons why I as a black woman have at least a little bit of investment in how black women are interacting with reality television as participants is because I want black women to experience love and more so I want black women to be seen experiencing love. I want it to be something that we witness on a regular basis just as much as we witness white women falling in love, just as much as we witness other women falling in love, I want us to be able to witness black women experiencing that same deep romantic love, that same blissful, non-traumatic love. Now, if you are not particularly invested in that, then this is probably not the video, this is probably not the episode for you, so keep it pushing. But if you are invested in that and you do actually believe that media impacts culture and that whether or not we see someone being loved on screen can translate to us loving them off screen or contribute to the way in which we love them off screen, stick around. Now, I wanna first talk about the John Boyega thing um, and how that I think highlights how we actually perceive black women in relation to romance and in the relation to the pursuit of romantic love. For those of y'all who don't know, John Boyega a couple weeks ago stated publicly, I think it was on a red carpet or something that, and I'll put the links below, he stated that he exclusively prefers to date black women. And this sent everyone in a tizzy when I say people didn't know what to do, white women, the white women were losing their minds. And I think this created such, such an uproar. This was such a disturbance. This created such turbulence for so many people is because we are not used to seeing black women as an object of affection, not an object of lust, not an object of a physical attraction, but an object of affection. And the difference is the amount of care that is offered to them. Typically, when it comes to how black women are represented in the media, it is often a reflection of misogynoir, or if you're new to this, a combination of misogyny and racism that harms black women. 
trigger warning, slavery and sexual assault. Massage noir through media goes all the way back to slavery, how black women were literal property and the only way which a black woman could be associated with romantic physical touch is when she was being sexually assaulted by her white master. That was the only context for attraction to a black woman. And even after slavery was abolished, and even after Juneteenth when slavery was officially abolished, there was, all, there was so much emphasis on a black woman's body exclusively through media. You know, there, a bunch of racist paraphernalia on license plates, on salt and pepper shakers, on teacups, in magazines, on TV shows. The black woman's body was commodified in a way that is unmatched in American history. Now, fast forward to today, of course we see where that trace is from. Of course we see the resemblance. Slavery wasn't that long ago and those kinds of images were still prevalent through the 60s. That's 50, 60 years ago, not a long time. And I've talked about this in another video, but does John Boyega saying that he prefers to date black women change how the racist person next to you sees black women? Maybe, maybe not. But what I do think it does is reveal to us the level of scarcity that we are facing when it comes to Black women being viewed as potential romantic partners. Basically, it reveals that we're not at the top of anybody's list, or at the very least, that's what people think that other people think. Now, I wanted to include as many examples as possible to prove my point. So today, I'm going to be talking about five specific dating reality shows. The first one is Love is Blind. Now, I did watch Love is Blind. I watched the first season, the second season, and I'm now in the third season. I'm very caught up and am looking forward to the new episode tonight, particularly for, you know, research purposes. I did want to highlight a few things. The one thing that I found in season two was how poorly the women of color were treated on the show by their male counterparts and how these men viewed them in relation to the white woman who they could see as potential romantic partners. Now, first, let's talk about Deep Deep. Now, if you don't know, Deep Deep is a brown woman who dated another brown man named Shake. Now, one thing that you'll find out about Shake if you do a single Google search is that a lot of people don't like him. And a lot of people don't like him probably because of the statement that he made claiming that Deep Deep reminded him of his aunt. Now, this to me told me one thing, the statement that he made. It told me that he has a lot of probably anti-racism that he needs to deconstruct within himself because this is a sentiment that you hear from a lot of men of color in regards to how they find themselves attracted to women who are not women of color. What they'll typically say is that they're not attracted to the woman who most resembles their race or most resembles their ethnicity because they remind them of a caretaker or they remind them of their mother or their aunt. Now studies show that this is actually a reflection of men of color only viewing women of color as caretakers or as people who they view as primarily of service to them. So that means that they are not being perceived as romantic partners potentially, but that they are in fact being perceived as motherly figures or someone who's going to take care of them outside of a romantic context. And that has its roots in racism as well. It reminds me of the mammy trope that was attributed to a lot of to a lot of black women who were homemakers. And if you know anything about the mammy trope, the mammy trope was one way to regain power over black women to desexualize us and defeminize us. When Shake said this, and along with other things that Shake was saying, that's why everyone harped on him. He was giving such a prime example of self-hate. Now I want to take a look at Ayana and Jarrett's relationship. Now, if you know anything about Ayana and Jarrett, you know that Jarrett is a black man, Ayana is a black woman. And Jarrett was someone who, and the nature of the show kind of lends itself to this, but Jarrett had to at one point decide who to propose to. It was either Ayana or it was Mallory, who was a Latina woman. And you could kind of tell through her speech through the wall that you're not allowed to see people through. You, you could kind of tell that she had some sort of accent. And so I think you could assume that she was Latina or had some at least mixed race influence in her. And then on the other hand, you have Ayana, who very clearly has has Afrocentric cadence and just some of the terms she would use, you could tell that she was black just based on her voice or that she had some sort of black influence. And I'm not one to decide or to, you know, to project my own insecurities on someone else or to make assumptions about what someone wants or what someone's thinking or feeling. But a part of me does think that Jarrett went for Mallory because he knew that there was a chance that he wouldn't end up with a black woman. Now that is me being 
prescriptive. That is me maybe, you know, stepping over my bounds, but that's just the me thing. Even that, that point aside, the way he connected with Ayana, or at least the way that the camera showed him connecting with Ayana, was on a much deeper level. And he shared lots of intimacies about his life, almost like he was in a therapy, se therapy session. And she revealed a lot of heavy details about her background and about her trauma. And they seemed to really bond on that level. Now, when it comes to Mallory, it seems that their relationship was more surface level. And I hate to, again, be prescriptive or I hate to make assumptions about what someone else is thinking or feeling at any given moment. But from what they showed us, from what editing showed us, it didn't seem to be as deep of a connection as his was with Ayana. And so that's, so that's why I do have a lot more questions about how he even saw that as a potential mate. Now what we learned is that he ended up picking Mallory first and she rejected him. And then he had to pick Ayana. And I, now granted he was upfront with Ayana about the fact that she was, you know, for lack of a better term, his second choice. But then Ayana had to make a decision. And something that I understand deeply in Ayana's defense, sadly, is the idea of feeling like there are slim pickings out here because you're a black woman you know, because you have been told your whole life through images and even sometimes directly to your face that you're undesirable, that no one will want to date you because you're Black. And so I understand that moment of, of, of turmoil that she was under that they showed us um, with the editing of the show. She was really going through a lot. You really see her t t toss, like you really see her toiling with this idea and trying to come to a decision. And ultimately she decided to accept his proposal and then there was another scene after the fact when they all meet each other in person all the exes and Jared is overly flirtatious with Mallory in such an inappropriate way that if I was Ayana I'd be out of there <laughs> ciao I get to step in if, if and here's how I view cheating this is just Shamaya philosophy if you wouldn't feel comfortable doing it around your partner you shouldn't be doing it at all in the end they ended up breaking up Jarrett and Ayana, because Jarrett didn't want to sacrifice certain aspects of his life. And that's all she wrote. Now to me, what this highlights is an unwillingness for producers to find men on dating shows, particularly a show like Love is Blind, who actually are invested in dating Black women and actually care about exploring a potential romantic partnership with Black women. Also, Lauren, who is a Black woman who was on season one of the show, one of, I think, the two surviving couples to date from the show, but she does say that she was disappointed with, the, with how the show in this current season has cut out the Black women's love stories on the show. I remember seeing maybe three or four Black women in the mix when I was watching this season. I didn't see any of those women in the pods. I didn't get to know, I, I don't know their names. Like I, I, I didn't even get to know their names. I don't know who they talked to. I don't know anything about them. And that's to, with the exception of this one mixed race woman who seems like she has like a um, Latinx upbringing, like a Latinx upbringing, or at the very least raised by a white family, which is fine, like there's nothing wrong with that. I just, I just think that there's a very specific kind of black woman that they're highlighting and we didn't get to see any, any obviously black women pursuing love on the show this season. And I get Lauren's point, that's disappointing. And typically in media, we only see black women as the alternate choice or as the means to an end, as the accessory to a white person's love story. Now imagine being Deepti or Ayana, and I worked in, even though we're talking exclusively about Black women here, imagine being deep deep where someone is constantly telling other people how unattracted to you they are because you remind them of your, their mother, because you remind them of their aunt, and how traumatizing. And because Black women are women of color, and we are, as I've illustrated, the most disrespected women, maybe except next to Indigenous women, in American history, you can understand how how it feels like there's a lot more at stake here. Now, I also wanted to highlight Love on the Spectrum, even though there really are no Black women on Love on the Spectrum. And maybe there was one, maybe there was one. I have to look clo closer at the casting list. But um, apparently ain't no Black people autistic out here trying to date. This is news to me. This is news to me. Um, but moving on, moving on from that. <laughs> That's pretty much all I have to say about Love on the Spectrum. Um, yeah, we're not really there. Maybe we were once. I'll have to double check on that um, and I'll, I'll let y'all know if I'm wrong about that. Now, The Bachelor. Let's talk about it. There's so much to talk about when it pertains to The Bachelor. First thing is the fact that on The Bachelor, 
I don't think that there's ever been a black woman chosen as the person that someone picks at the end. I don't think that's ever, ever happened. They are not the one with the happy ending. I think part of it is because of the setup of, you know, lining up a black woman with a whole bunch of white women or two black women with a whole bunch of white women or non-black women. Especially when it pertains to the type of bachelors that we've had in the past, they weren't going to end up with a black woman. A lot of them, they weren't. And that has a lot to do with culture, with what culture you, you grow up with. That has a lot to do with the kind of community you, you are comfortable in, the kind of communities that you choose. And they weren't gonna, they weren't gonna end up with a sister. I'm sorry, they weren't, um, they weren't. And I will say too, that The Bachelor has a track record of finding leads um, who don't necessarily have a good relationship with themselves or have a sound understanding of what they need emotionally. And what I will say is black women are for grownups. Black women are for grownups and we can smell an imposter from a while away because we've had to. We can smell the imposter on you. And you know, I would I would hate to phrase this. I don't I don't want to frame this discussion as black women are being picked because people think we're ugly. Like, yes, sure, there's some people who think that we're ugly and you know, in terms of the marriage market, we are not high on the top of that list just because of the way that people perceive us, or even more specifically, the way that people perceive how others would perceive them partner to us. Not necessarily how they view us, not necessarily how attractive they are to us, not necessarily how smart, how brilliant, how creative, how funny, how sexy they think we are, but how they think their friends will perceive them partnered with us. Yeah, that's a big thing, especially when it comes to straight cis men. And um, I have some straight cis men friends and they have literally told me, yeah, like sometimes a guy won't date a woman if he thinks his friends won't like her or if he thinks his friends Will, will will not approve or if he thinks his friends don't think she's attractive now what makes you think that doesn't apply when we're talking about racial dynamics when we're talking about um, eurocentric beauty standards do the math so yeah the black women on the bachelor don't tend to make it far not necessarily because they are not desirable but because they end, don't end up being compatible with the leads either because a the leads do not perceive them as being attractive enough to be partnered with them which is different than them being attractive in their eyes, it's different. Or B, the black women are just not dealing with the tomfoolery. They're just not dealing with it. And I think a part of that too, um, the, on the production end, there's some responsibility there to cast men who are actually interested in dating women of color, who are actually interested in dating black women. Because it's one thing to say, oh, I don't have a preference. Oh, I think everyone's attractive. And it's another thing to say, I think there's a cultural difference or I don't think that our cultures would clap would 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 align well or I don't think she'll get along with my friends. It's giving coded language. Now, I think a really prime example of the producers not actually considering race to be a factor when it comes to developing strong romantic connections is with the Rachel Kirkconnell situation. So Rachel Kirkconnell is someone who was dating the first black male contestant on The Bachelor, Matt James. Now, I didn't expect a Matt James to end up with a black woman. That's just me because I always know. And there's like, guys, like there's nothing wrong with having a white mom. There's nothing wrong with not dating a black woman because you didn't fall in love with a black woman. Like I get it, but like, I wasn't. The girls are gonna get it. It wasn't gonna happen with Matt James. Yes, I get that part of the Bachelor aesthetic, part of the marketing, part of the packaging is selling a fantasy. But when that fantasy comes at the expense of the Black cast members, that's when I have to put my foot on the brakes. Like that's when I have to reel it back into reality and say, hey, race is a huge part of a relationship if you're a person of color. Like if you are dating out here, assuming that the person you fall in love with potentially is not gonna see race if you're a person of color, I'm sorry, you must be white passing or even the language about white passing is really weird, but I'm sorry, like it's gonna come up. It's gonna come up, especially if you're a black woman, like it's gonna come up. Your baby's not gonna be white. Like, I'm sorry, them jeans too strong. They're not gonna be, they're not going to be coming out like Elsa. You have to talk about these things. I didn't even tell you about what happened with Rachel Kirkconnell. So basically, 
a picture of her was found on Facebook or on one of her social media platforms where she was dressed in southern garb, given homage to the Old South, um, at an antebellum party. Now, if you don't know anything about an antebellum party, it, it um, it's the same, I, um, I would say, it's the same aroma, it's the same flavor of, you know, a Confederate statue. It's talking about the history of the South, it's celebrating the history of, of the South, um, while completely erasing the slavery part. You know, it's it's completely ignoring the slavery part and it's glorifying the, you know, the frills and, you know, the horses and whatever else there was. Um, but yeah, slavery was a really big part of that, a part of the Southern history. And um, this party that she went to was glorifying that. Now, did I think she was a flaming, like, KKK racist back then? No, but this was just distasteful at best and, um, ignorant at worst. And she wasn't like 12, she was she was like 18 or 19 at least. So yeah, not a good look. Rachel Lindsay, not Rachel Kirkconnell. <laughs> let's just, let's establish this right now. Rachel Lindsay is black, Rachel Kirkconnell is white. So Lindsay, Rachel Lindsay talked about in an interview how this is evidence of the producers of The Bachelor not thoroughly looking into contestants past enough to protect their black leads. Now, I know that she can have something to say about this because we'll just we'll wait till we get to the bachelorette segment of this of this episode because we go deep dive, yeah, we go deep. I think another indicator too of a lack of understanding that bachelor nation or that the bachelor producers have of race when it comes to dating is in Chris Harrison, the host of the show's response to the whole Rachel Kirkconnell incident. The next show that I want to talk about is The Bachelorette. Rachel Lindsay was the first black ever bachelorette in Bachelor Nation history. And one thing that she did talk about after the show, after she ended up finding the love of her life and we're very excited for her, was that on the production end, her love story to Brian, her now husband, was not as fleshed out, was not as romanticized as other leads storylines were, i.e. non-black leads. And even on her season, there were men in the running who were contestants to end up, you know, dating her at the end, to end up proposing to her at the end, who claimed that they had never dated a black woman before. Why would you put someone on a show where a black woman is the lead who has never dated a black woman or who obviously doesn't seem interested in dating a black woman? So that's not to say that just because someone has never dated a black woman before that they are not interested in, at the, in it at the current moment, but it's fishy and also puts that woman in a pretty precarious position. No black woman and no woman of color, mind you, wants to be a white man's guinea pig. It's not appealing to us to be the first black ethnic woman you've ever dated. No, someone's got to do it, probably, but we don't want it to be us. Even contestants on her show who weren't white said that they had never dated a black woman before. And that, of course, might be due to upbringing, to the surroundings that they were in when they were, you know, experimenting with dating. But why was the number of contestants on her season that had dated black women before so low? And that's where production has an issue, in my opinion. I would also argue that some of her contestants were actively racist or actively participating in bigotry during the season. There was this one character, I don't remember his name, but there was one contestant who habitually antagonized another black contestant who was trying to date Rachel, telling him that he was violent, that he was dangerous, and these are not things you say to a black person or about a black person. Reason being, it makes them look like a threat, regardless if they're even acting as such. And yet this man continued to antagonize this black contestant. Why in the world would you put this white man in the position to date Rachel, a black woman, when he has shown such lack of care for black people? Even more disgust, like I would say the part that was even more disgusting about this, this, this plot line was that it seemed like the show itself, the producers were egging this on. This was a huge plot point for them. This was, you know, this provided a lot of shock value, but how disgusting, how gross. I can't imagine the amount of stress that Lindsay was under during this process, especially not knowing what kind of men were being put in front of you, not knowing whether or not these men actually genuinely cared about your well-being or the people like you. I will say though, being the bachelorette is maybe the only time when being on a black dating show, when being on a dating reality show is beneficial for black women because it's the most powerful position that they can be in. 
being the one woman that everyone else is vouching for, yeah, there's authority in that. And there are things that you can do as the lead that in another position you wouldn't be able to do. You can decide how much time you spend with the person. You can decide to halt the show altogether. You can decide to leave. Now maybe that's a breach of contract and there's other legalities that go along with that, but you have so much more freedom as a black lead on The Bachelor than you do as a contestant on Love is Blind. Now the last show that I'm gonna talk about is Love Island. I am not a habitual Love Island watcher. I'm not a fan, but I love the discourse. So let's do it. Let's do the discourse. And before you say, well, it's just Love Island. It's, you know, perceived as the trashiest of reality TV. It can't possibly be indicative of American culture or any kind of culture. But I do want to remind you that the least common denominator is often the most applicable social mirror. And by that, I mean the, the people who are receiving the least amount of information about these, you know, deep topics, the people who put the least amount of energy into bettering themselves, deconstructing racism or sexism or misogynoir. That's the majority of people in America. That's the majority of people. People aren't, the way people actually think isn't the Washington Post. Like the, the, the average Joe is not, is not writing out dissertations. The average Joe is not citing sources. The average Joe is saying, my life is hard and this is how I view everything because my life is hard. Or, you know, very, very few people are having intense conversations on TikTok about racism or about ableism. Like most people are going on TikTok to learn TikTok to learn dances and to, to listen to fun songs and to see cool outfits. Like the majority of people are not doing this work. <laughs> like they're not. So that's why I think that Love and Island can be a really interesting microscope into to how most people, and by that I mean people who who rely on the, the lowest common denominator, and by that I mean who have the least amount of access and you know to, to information, who have the least amount of time to do these these deep dives and this and researching and and going to therapy, like the people who do not have access to all of those resources, they're the biggest reflection of culture, I think. Now, what we do know about Love Island is that it's really heavy in misogyny. Like they are really heavy handed when it comes to misogyny. But then when we look at how misogynoir is manifested, we can see that those roots are also there and that Love Island can actually be really brutal, particularly toward the dark skinned black woman on the show. We can look at Kaz Kamley, a dark skinned black woman, gorgeous, wonderful on the show. And through how her audience treated her versus how they treated her white counterparts who participated in the same kind of behavior that she did or, her, or who did the same things, how they immediately painted her as the villain and gave her very little to no benefit of the doubt. Not even that, but black women are being mistreated in the cast. The last thing that I'm gonna talk about is the idea of black women fighting for scraps. Now, if we look at Lauren and Cameron from the first season of Love is Blind, and we look at how Lauren has over 2 million followers, which is more than any bachelorette or contestant on The Bachelor, we can see that people love Lauren and more specifically, they love Lauren's story. They love the story of a black woman in love as some sort of symbol of national healing. And I say it's a symbol because it is not actually rooted in facts and it's not actually rooted in actual progress a lot of the time. Just because one person loves a black woman, it does not mean that racism is over. It doesn't mean that black women are not still dying at of a higher rate than white women on the delivery table. It doesn't mean that black women who have the highest degrees, that are the most certified, aren't still getting paid less than their white counterparts who aren't as certified or who have not completed up to the same level of schooling. All these problems still exist. And just because we see a black woman being nurtured, being romanced, blissfully in love on TV, doesn't mean these problems go away. But what I do think that it does is give us some hope. And I think what it highlights is the fact that black women are so hungry to see themselves being loved on screen. We are so eager to see romantic fulfillment that we so often witness our white counterparts experiencing reflected black on us. I don't think that most dating shows are non-beneficial to black women in totality. Because as an article in Refinery29 illustrated, black women may not get the guy but they will secure the bag. Lauren Hamilton has over 2 million followers on Instagram, and that is money. That is life changing. So if you're a black woman and you're trying to decide whether or not to go on a dating show, I'm not gonna tell you not to do it. What I am going to say is to make the most of it. Because one thing that black women are really good at doing 
is taking control of our own fates. And we don't need to be chosen in order to do that. Thank you for listening. This was another episode of Cap Twist, please. Please like and subscribe if you feel like it, if you feel led. And I'll see you next time. Don't forget to join the Patreon. Stay weird. Bye.